Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Acronix today with Kent Orthner, who's going to talk about embedded FPGAs and how to use that if you're an ASIC designer. So Kent, for an ASIC designer, what's changing when you get to an EFPGA? What's different about an EFPGA versus an ASIC? Uh, what does it buy you? What's, what do you have to know that you did, don't have to know if you're just designing an ASIC? Ed, for somebody working on an ASIC, instantiating an embedded FPGA IP core is really just the same as any other IP core. So imagine you have your ASIC design and you're purchasing some sort of IP component from some company, such as, say, a PCI Express controller. You may have a CPU, you may have a cache, you may have any variety of different components that are connected on this ASIC device. An embedded FPGA really looks like, feels like any other IP component that you might decide to put inside of your device. Except for one thing, you have all these gates that you can program that you don't have on any other IP, right? Absolutely. Reprogrammability is the reason to put an FPGA on your device in the first place. So the typical ASIC device, you put everything together, you tape out, you get something back, and it is what it is. That's it. You're done. If there's bugs, there's bugs. Whatever function you put into it is the function that it does. With an FPGA, inside this FPGA block here, we have thousands of little components that look like a variety of different gates, flip-flops, logic elements, DSP blocks, and everything else. Once you get this ASIC back from the fab, it's sitting on your desk and you're ready to go, you can at that time put a new design right here inside of the FPGA core. It's really very simple. So this chip comes back from the fab. It, it has your embedded FPGA in it. What do you do with this? I mean, you have to program this now, right? The design flow for using the embedded FPGA is extremely similar to how you've designed the ASIC in the first place. For example, let's say you get this back from the, back from the fab, and you have some piece of ASIC logic on the side of it that's feeding it numbers. Let's imagine that we have an input that we've called A, we have an input that we've called B, we have an output that we've called Y, and we have a clock. When you designed the ASIC and you put the embedded FPGA core in it, at that time you decided that these are the inputs and outputs that you have and that you're going to connect those up to the remainder of the ASIC. Now this comes back from the fab, it's sitting on your desk, it's all powered up, and you want to put something in here. All you need to do is open your favorite text editor, I prefer Emacs, and write a traditional Verilog design. So you may have inside your Verilog module something that looks extremely familiar. Always add pause edge clock. Y gets A plus B. Verilog 101. You write this, you save it, you open this file, run it through synthesis, run it through place and route, and about two minutes later, you will have a bitstream that can be loaded in here, and this sea of gates becomes the adder that takes the A input, the B input, does an addition, and feeds the results back to Y. When you're putting things through the ACE tool suite, we include static timing analysis. Something like this is going to tell you that it runs at around 650 megahertz. When you design this, you know that you connected up a clock that was running at perhaps 500 megahertz. You have more than an ample period remaining, so it just works. Can you change what's already programmed in there afterward? Absolutely. That's the beauty of an FPGA, is it is field programmable again and again and again and again. The function that goes in here is actually controlled by a specialized RAM cell. So when you write this Verilog module, or VHDL, we support both, and run it through the tool chain, we create a file that we refer to as a bitstream. It's basically a set of instructions that go into a portion of the embedded FPGA car that we call the FPGA control unit. This bitstream instructs this to configure all of the various lookup tables, sequential elements, DSP blocks, on-chip memory, everything else to do the function that you provide. All you need to do to change the function of this block is to download a new, a new bitstream configuration file. Depending on your design flow, you may have several of these ready to go so that you're able to switch back and forth between different functions as the chip is running, and even after it's out in the field. Alternatively, you might be using this to 
keep up with changing specifications, where you don't need to change it on a second by second basis. It's more as specifications are updated, we make the changes then. Inside an FPGA, you, you have fairly specialized blocks. You've got DSPs, you've got RAM. How do you work with those? That's exactly correct. So inside the FPGA core, we have columns of specialized blocks. We have fairly large dual port, two clock memories that can fit inside these blocks. We also have fairly sophisticated DSP macros. The memories have built-in capabilities to do read-before-write operations on multiple clock domains. They also have a FIFO controller built into each one. For something like the DSP, it can do operations such as multiply, accumulate, with a minimum of FPGA logic, because it's built into the hardware here, and allowing you to achieve a much higher frequency. To use these, there's really two flows. The easiest and most straightforward is to just infer the behavior inside your design. So in this example here, where I said Y gets A plus B, the Acronix toolchain understands that this can be implemented with one of the DSP primitives. So when it maps this to the logic inside the FPGA, it will take advantage of this, and this design would effectively use zero lookup tables and zero percent of the reprogrammable resources in the FPGA other than a single DSP instance. Memory is not much more complicated. You would have an always block that says on the rising edge of clock if write enabled is asserted. Then memory, given your address pointer, takes on a value. And you'd have a second always block that says that for every clock cycle, the output gets the memory of that location. From that, our tool flow can instantiate one of these memory arrays. Now, our blocks have some more sophisticated capabilities that don't map easily to RTL. To take advantage of those, inside your design, you can, by hand, instantiate one of our blocks in these special modes, and then our synthesis flow and the place and root engine will recognize that you've instantiated one of the blocks directly and give you exactly what you asked for inside the FPGA core. One of the things that you're talking about here on inferencing, uh, multiply, accumulate is classic machine learning, right? That's really where you're headed with some of this stuff. Oh, that, absolutely. When you look at the inferencing portion of machine learning, it consists almost entirely of fixed point multiply accumulate functions, which map beautifully to these DSP blocks. For machine learning applications, when you originally configure the amount of resources that you have in your embedded FPGA instance, you can specify that you would like a rich set of these fixed point DSP, which gives you up to thousands of multiply accumulates on a single embedded FPGA instance. So when you think about machine learning, which is becoming very important these days uh, in a lot of different areas, the floating point has typically been the what you've been using on the training side, but the fixed point has been what you're using on the inferencing side. Where does this fit in? When you're training a neural network, what you're doing is finding a solution to an equation that represents the weights of many different relationships between many different variables. When you're trying to find these weights, you're basically taking the derivative of each one as you learn. So for cases where your, your machine learning algorithm has guessed correctly, you're going, you're going to add a little bit to every weight that caused you to get the correct answer. When you guess incorrectly, you're going to reduce the weight of everything that led to that incorrect answer. The amount by which you're increasing and reducing these weights can be really, really tiny, which is why floating point can be so important. Once you finish the learning portion and you've determined what the weights are using these floating point numbers, you then are going to create an inferencing algorithm. With the inferencing, you're using the weights, but they don't have to be as precise. You're not trying to add a tiny little bit forward or backwards based on correct and incorrect guesses. What you're doing now is taking this massive data set of input images or whatever you happen to be classifying with your machine learning algorithm, applying the fixed point weights to them to come up quickly with an answer. In the industry, you would typically learn an AI algorithm one time so that you have all of these weights. Once you have them, that last decimal point isn't really so important. You figured out the weights, you can now round everything off and to be used for inference. You've learned it once, but now you're going to roll out the inferencing engine potentially thousands of times so you can be using the facial recognition, image recognition, whatever it happens to be across a multitude of servers. And this is one of the areas where an eFPGA really shines, right? One of the beauties of an embedded FPGA here is that it's reprogrammable, which means that as the algorithms change, they become updated, as you change what it is you want to recognize or what it is you want to learn, what it is you want to inference, 
you can reprogram what's in this embedded FPGA core to provide hardware acceleration for the inference while not being locked down to a specific implementation. Okay, back to nuts and bolts here. Um, how do you manage the timing constraints in an embedded FPGA? That's an excellent question. So before you tape out your design, you have your embedded FPGA here, and it's talking to some other logic inside the ASIC. Typically, you would have registers into and out of. I'll show the inputs on the left and the outputs on the right. And this is going to go to some sequential element, a flip-flop, somewhere in the FPGA. With various designs in the FPGA, this element could be placed in different places. Our ACE tool suite knows the portion of the clock period that is consumed outside of the embedded FPGA, and it knows to place the sequential logic inside the FPGA to account for this delay. Likewise, for outputs, it knows the delay from the output of the embedded FPGA core to the sequential register in the ASIC logic, and it can place this, taking that into consideration. What have you got in terms of interfaces for this? The interfaces for an embedded FPGA are really whatever you want them to be. Commonly, people would have something like an AXI interface connected to an on-chip interconnect to issue commands, to do compute acceleration, and to do traditional SOC type functionality. But often, people will implement an ASIC block abutting the embedded FPGA to have some special logic here. Imagine, for example, you have a ternary cam with some particular interface that is specific to that IP core. You can have a portion of your embedded FPGA talk to that ternary cam using its interface. You can have an AXI interface here for communication for the rest of the system. And you may decide to have a portion of the FPGA driving I.O. pins to the outside world. Within a complex chip, you also have a lot of different clocks. How does that all work within the FPGA? Absolutely. So when you specify the details of the embedded FPGA instance you want, you provide us with information about the number of clock resources you expect to use. Common embedded FPGA instances from Acronix have up to 256 different clock domains, where we have, sorry, 128 of them coming in from the top and 128 coming in from the bottom. These can be driven directly by clock pins outside. They can be driven by logic inside your ASIC. And you can, of course, instantiate PLL so that you change the frequency of these various clocks depending on the design. When you write the Verilog that defines the bitstream that defines the contents of the FPGA, you can easily have multiple clocks. So I could say at pause edge clock one, do one sequential function, and I could have a second always block that refers to a second clock doing a second function. Inside the FPGA, you would just use traditional techniques for, the long, for handing off data between the two clock domains. When I think about an embedded FPGA, it can be almost anything. It can be small, it can be large. Um, you've got to configure these things. How long does that process take? High performance embedded FPGAs typically provide you with a variety of different configuration options. If you consider the fact that we have this FPGA core connected on something like an AXI interface, one of the options that we provide is to embed a half DMA core right in the FPGA control unit. When you give this a configuration command, it's able to issue read transactions onto the main interconnect, which get routed into, say, a DDR interface or some sort of on-chip memory. Because this is typically a wide and fast AXI interface, operating perhaps at 128 bits, we're able to configure the FPGA very, very quickly. Typical numbers might be in the range of two milliseconds per 100,000 lookup tables. Other options for configuring the embedded FPGA include configuring it via a built-in JTAG controller, which is commonly used when you're in the lab and debugging and cycling and using some of our on-device debug tools. Embedded FPGAs also typically include the ability to program the FPGA from an off-chip flash device. In this case, the FPGA can be up and running before the processor in the system has booted its operating system. Basically what you're testing though is sort of something that isn't fully formed. How do you do that? The way you verify the logic inside your embedded FPGA instance is the same as how you verify your logic in an ASIC. 
except that it's much lower risk. So you have this Verilog module that you've written. You can write a test bench that runs around it, that generates the clock, provides some stimulus, and checks for the correct response, completely independent of the embedded FPGA tool chain. Once it's in the embedded FPGA, however, we have all sorts of tools to help you out with debugging. One of the most important ones is we include an embedded logic analyzer. So in your design, before you compile it, you specify which signals you'd like to be able to see in the logic analyzer, compile your design, get your bitstream, configure it. Five minutes later, you now have visibility into any subset of signals that you'd like. This shows up in our tools as a waveform view, just like you would expect to see from a simulator, except that it's based on what it's sampled in real hardware. Ken Arthur, thank you for a great explanation. Thanks a lot for your time today, Ed. Take care.